welcome back Trolling Solo, my name is Adam Smith and in this video we are headed right back into the playthrough for Final Girl from Van Ryder Games which is currently on Kickstarter right now. We have Asami here going up against Geppetto at the Carnival of Blood. We, as of part one, had things going very very well in the first chunk of the video and then near the tail end of things, well, Geppetto got the upper hand and is back up on his feet again. We had him whittled down in health and he's now semi revived himself back and has more health at his disposal which is not good so I had an opportunity there to take him out and I missed that opportunity now the one thing I want to talk about right off the bat before we dive right into where we left off is first off if you haven't checked out the setup video or part number one I'll put a link to the whole playthrough up in the top right hand corner right now you want to check that out first before you watch this video otherwise none of this will make any sense as to where I currently am now the next thing I want to mention is just a couple corrections and catches based off of part number one. I'll go through those right now and then we'll dive straight into gameplay. In part number one, at the 4145 mark of the video, I mentioned that one of the puppets here, the one at the animal cages, needs to move to the southern space below it in order to correct positioning based on that prior video. Thankfully, no gameplay impact. With that corrected, let's now talk about bullet point two and three, which are in the pinned comment of part number one. At 1717 in part number one, I discarded two cards to convert a three that I got on one of my rolls and I wanted to convert that to a success which would have given me just one success but for some weird reason I thought I'd go ahead and take the double success row which would have been a little bit different in terms of how time would have worked out at that moment so I gained two time when I should have lost one time so because of that if you do the math essentially I need to reduce my overall time by three in order to balance things out. I should have had one less than what I had, and I actually increased it by two, so I really caused a separation there. Uh, but that's okay, we're going to correct it here. I will kind of penalize myself here going into this upcoming turn to make up for it. But there was one other thing that I missed that is really important and something that's worth mentioning and worth keeping an eye on while you're playing the game. Now, in the part number one video, I was able to rack this level all the way up to this spot at one point in the video, and if it continues, Continues to be reduced that horror track it will basically butt up against this symbol that's right here and this symbol tells us that we'll gain a time and there was one point in the video in part number one around the 48 minute mark where we did actually gain a reduction on the horror track which would have given me one time I missed out on taking it so if I'm supposed to reduce the time by three to make up for my miss here or my confusion around how I resolve focus and I was supposed to gain one here really to balance things out I'm just going to minus things by two going into this upcoming turn and we're all squared away. So just like that my time has been reduced to make up for what I missed in the prior video it's also worth mentioning if this track ever has your individual here on the marker move all the way to the ex really terrible side of the terror track and then be pushed even further in other words more more horror icons show up then you're actually going to increase the bloodlust every single time so that you don't want to happen which is why I put such a priority on pushing this as high up as I did in part number one we'll see if I can keep it in green for as long as possible that's going to wrap up any corrections and now we're going to talk about the one outstanding thing that I threw back to the community and that was around the golf cart event the employee transport which is a golf cart that we're allowed based on an event to place in any of the corners of this location board we had to choose one looking through the comments on part number one I'm taking the very first one I found because I actually really liked what was stated there and in essence it stated from Merlin's Manor I'd put the golf cart with the people in the forest of horrors because it can carry those people to the exit if you head back over there you could rescue a bunch of people this would let you get back to full health again using that wonderful health space that I have still available for rescuing people on Asami's character card and getting that heart back could really be valuable to be able to still wield the strongman hammer which we know can throw a lot of damage so I like that strategy so let's go ahead and place the golf cart at the forest of horrors and that's it let's go ahead and begin the very first turn inside of this video 
So going into this turn, I only have two cards, and they're not exactly everything that I want at the moment, but I could make them work to my advantage here. Now, Distraction is a good one. If I happen to roll two successes, I can reduce the horror level down by two, which actually would net me another time because we'd move this one space and then move it again, but it can't move again. So then I would get an additional time. So that's a plus. And then right beside it, as you can see in the top row, I actually gain two more time. So that would be a way to really bump the time that I just kind of lost <laughs> based on my mistakes from part number one and replenish that back and hopefully allow me to do more going into the next turn. So that's a nice card and I'll probably be going ahead and playing that next. Now the other card I have in my hand is a sprint and based on where we just positioned the golf cart, it might be worth my while to actually sprint to the golf cart if I'm in that space in the upkeep phase with the golf cart, I can use it to transport those two individual victims in there, two spaces towards an exit, which could be really handy because then I could take advantage of saving them to gain a health to get me back to a total of five health. The more health I have, the better going up against Geppetto for another big time hit. So saying all that, let's go ahead and do this distraction. We're going to do the horror check for it. We're going to grab three dice and we're going to see how this goes. Hopefully it goes in my favor. We'll see. I only have dice here. I don't have the ability to actually convert threes and fours. So I really don't want to see threes and fours or ones and twos. So this is a really kind of eh, sketchy roll, but we'll see how it goes. Yep, that's about how much I expected this uh, this roll to pan out. So that just basically netted me a whole bunch of nothing. So I told you the dice would eventually start throwing uh, wrenches into my plans there. So this distraction card now goes down to a failure as I can't even convert these. I only have one card in hand. Can't discard two to, gain, gain, uh, to convert to a success. So it puts me into this red area here, which states that I could choose to lose a horror level down to here, but then I would have to sacrifice four time, which would burn everything that I currently have. And that's kind of scary, but the good news is I would be staying in the green area. On the other side of the coin, I could also choose, and this is interesting because it actually has an ore there, I could choose to actually uh, have the horror level go up, but that's bad because then I, of course, no longer get three dice anymore. I only get two and I don't like that, uh, but then I only lose two times. So I have a decision to make here and it's a tricky one. I've decided to go ahead with the bottom one there, so we are going to increase the horror level. I've dropped down by two time. The reason I want to hold on to some time is I still want the ability to actually try and sprint, and we're going to be able to try and do that right now. So that distraction card is now fully resolved, but not exactly resolved in the way I would have liked. Going into this check for sprint, I'm in even worse of a spot because now I have, of course, no ability still to convert any successes, but now I'm not rolling three dice anymore, which was really fun. I really enjoyed doing that that, but I only get two dice going forward. And that's going to make, you know, trying to get the three movement that I typically have been getting in part number one, much tougher all of a sudden. Um, and I might not get anything here and there could even be a risk to sprinting. And this is actually worth pondering over. Do I want to risk the possibility of failing on a sprint and hurting myself? Now, what's terrifying about this is the fact that I'm literally standing in the big top tent with Geppetto. So the fun part is if I don't take this risk to get out of this tent, I'm going to get hit regardless. So the question is, do I risk it to, for the hope that I can run away? But if I fail, I hurt myself and then Geppetto gets to slash me up on top of it. So it's twice as painful. Or do I just uh, stay put and uh, maybe try to pick up a card that could guard against an attack from him? That actually might be a better idea. So that's what I'm going to choose to do. I'm going to hold on to my sprint card for another day, hopefully later on in the next turn when I can maybe use a focus card in the future to hopefully boost myself back up to three dice and then make use of some movement that actually won't get me hurt. I'm going to stay put in Geppetto's space. This is horribly terrifying and it's always fun in this game when you get into situations where, well, you know, you're, you're choosing between the lesser of two evils, but even when you choose what you think is the lesser, it can end up being way worse. Into the planning phase we go, and there's literally one card that I want for two time, because that's all I have, which is going to deplete down to zero. I'm going to purchase the guard card, because I want to try my best to block anything that Geppetto is going to potentially throw at me. This reaction card should hopefully be handy. I'm also, of course, going to pick up all these free cards. So six cards here, two cards in hand. At this point, we're going to reset our time back to six. All the discarded cards, which are underneath, are going to go back into the tableau. So we're going to reset that right now. The tableau has been reset. We now move to the killer phase. Really looking forward to how this pans out. 
So taking a look at the location board right now, we know for the minions activating first and taking their action, it's always to spawn a puppet and then they're gonna focus on a victim closest to them and then move one space. Well, unfortunately, there's only one victim that is very, very close to all of the minions. So every single minion that is two spaces away from this victim is gonna be moving one space closer. So this victim really needs to get out of there. At this point, the killer is now gonna go and it's going to attack either a victim in its space or the final girl victims first but there are none so it's coming after the final girl for an attack this is where i'm going to grab my reaction card now how this guard card pans out in terms of a reaction is going to have a major ripple effect on whether or not i can use the strongman hammer to add three damage to a future attack because remember i need to be at four or more health in order to just wield it in terms of adding its damage to the attack so that's really, really bad because even if just one point of damage goes through, I am under four and that's not good. So we are grabbing two dice here. I need two successes to ignore all the damage based on the bloodlust and where it sits currently. The good news for me is it's at two damage. That's what Geppetto is gonna be throwing at me. So if I get two successes, all the damage has been blocked, which is a good thing. If I get one success, I can reduce the damage by two. So that's a plus, so I just just need to get one success of course if I fail well it states here to reduce one damage uh, or reduce damage by one to a minimum of one so it's reducing it but it's not going to get me out of the uh, you know situation of delaying my ability to use this in the future so I'm really hoping I land a success here I just want you guys to understand the weight of this roll because it really matters and I am a bit terrified now the good news is that I do have cards in hand now so because I have cards in hand, I can go ahead and cash two cards in to turn a three and a four into a success. So it's not that bad, but it is kind of a, you know, burning cards is never that much of a positive. And there's still the chance of outright failure here too. Here we go. Please, please let me guard this attack. Yes, best roll ever. Okay, so we got two successes. That's awesome. So we ignore everything that he throws us. Now you might think, hey, you're safe, you're good. We still have to go to the terror deck. And that's the one that scares me more than just Geppetto's regular attack. Because who knows what's coming at me from there. This one's called, how did the tiger get loose? If there are no victims on the board, discard this card and draw the next terror card. Okay, well there are victims on the board so we can continue on through here. All victims panic. All right, you guys ready for some chaos at the carnival? Every single victim in play is gonna panic. We'll start with this individual right here. We're gonna roll some dice, one for each one. Here we go. So we got ourselves a three. That's gonna send this individual up here. We'll start rolling for the Forest of Horrors. That is a terrible roll. We'll go ahead and land that flat. It's a four. It was a four until I knocked it over. Um, and that's going to head it up this direction. Everyone's kind of running north right now. Uh, we'll count that as a five, even though it was kind of half diagonal there. Uh, so that will be up there. And then this individual, I'm a bit terrified, kind of currently in the mix. Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of puppets all around. Let's see what happens. A six. Uh-oh. I think a six. Oh my gosh. I'm heading towards the animal cages, or at least the victim is, I should say. That's bad. Uh, likely very bad seeing as the tigers just got loose. Uh, three victims over here. Where are they headed? We have a six. So that's going to have this one headed up here to the Ferris wheel. We have... Another six. Oh my gosh, I wish I was holding all these sixes for later. And then finally, a two. A two is going to send this one over this way. We now move to that black banner in the middle of the tarot card. This is the thing I was terrified about because this black banner is first resolved by all the minions and then by the killer. So there's a potential here for a lot of killing. So for each puppet, I need to determine which victim is closest. So right now, House of Mirrors, this individual here is two spaces away from this victim and is two spaces away from the Animal Cages victim. Now, I have read a little bit ahead on the Animal Cages. It is really, really bad for this individual to be anywhere near it. However, 
It's only moving one space, but it's going to be going towards a victim. The other victim that's over here, or I should say down here, is three away. There's no way for that one to get down to that space. So this puppet is going to move to this location right here as it's the best space for it. It's not going to be able to do any killing, which is fantastic. Now the other two puppets are sitting right here, and they're only two spaces away from the individual at the animal cages who is the closest. So they are going to also take a one walk now, the question is whether they go here or here. I'm going to go ahead and just put one here. We'll just split them, seeing as that seems like the most fair thing to do. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the killer is going to be focused on a victim, not the final girl in this case, as the focus on the card states it's a victim. So it's going to move one space towards the nearest victim. So we've got a victim up here that's two spaces away. We have another one over here that's two spaces away. And we have one over here that's two spaces away. Now... Again, taking a look at the card, I know that a lot of craziness is about to ensue from the Tigers. Now for the killer, there are, you know, there's three options in terms of where you could go here. If we're going by the rule of infinite evil, we're not going to have the killer trying to put himself into harm's way when he has options to go elsewhere. So we're going to go ahead and have him move down south here. So he's actually leaving the final girl alone to head towards the other victim south, but that's going to keep him away from what's about to happen to a lot of puppets. Taking a look at the bottom of the card, this is what I was alluding to, and it's visible. So this is why I use the rule of infinite evil to keep the killer away from this situation. But guess what? The puppets, it made perfect sense to have them moving towards that victim as that was the closest one to them. And as uh, we can see right here, it says to do the following for the animal cages space and all spaces adjacent to it. Victims there are killed. So the one victim that at the animal cages that ran straight into the tigers just got eaten alive. The the enemies that are there or within one space are going to take a damage. That means each of the puppets are going to take a damage. They only have one health, so the tigers literally ate the victim that ran into its space and then went out and fed on all the puppets. So I just went from being terrified of the terror deck to loving the terror deck because we are about to see a whole bunch of individuals eaten alive and taken off this board. Now, the one victim that gets consumed at the animal cages will increase the blood loss by one. Thankfully, there's nothing else that needs to be resolved when we bump that up. Unfortunate things happen at carnivals, and in this case, it was probably one of the best things to ever happen. When puppets are killed off, whether the final girl kills them off, or in this case, the game itself chews them up and spits them out, they're going to end up in the exhausted area. As I mentioned moments ago, the bloodlust will go up, and as you can see, the next row above on the far left-hand side does not have an event we need to reveal. We made it all the way through the killer phase, and I couldn't have asked for a better one. The panic phase is next, but there is nobody around in the places where they were killed to panic in the first place, so we're skipping right past that, and now we move to the upkeep phase. Going into the upkeep phase, the only thing we have to keep our eye on is the events. The Clowns Everywhere card doesn't trigger because there are no victims in the big top or in any adjacent spaces. The Final Girl does not matter in that particular card's case. And in terms of the employee transport with the golf cart, well, we're not in a space with a golf cart, so we can't use it right now. So now we move into the action phase. I've got a bunch of cards in hand here. The killers actually move kind of in the direction I've hoped that he might, and that was not on purpose. That literally was using the rule of infinite evil, which kept him away from actually taking an extra damage from the tigers. Uh, but it works to my advantage now in my phase because it puts him closer to where the golf cart is and also where I could potentially save a victim, <laughs> the one victim south there, that I could bring to the exit to try to gain one health back if I need to. But I don't really need to at this moment. I could try to swing for the fences and kill him right now because in my hand I have a weak attack card that will do one damage. And if I pair this up with the strongman hammer, that would be four damage, which is exactly enough to hit him and then flip over the final token to see whether or not we've actually killed him or he's standing back up again for another round or so. And hopefully... We don't get beat up too bad in the process. The first thing that I want to do absolutely is to focus. I want to bump my horror level down so that I can get back up to using three dice again. Currently using two on this roll, which I don't necessarily like, but the chances of me landing a success hopefully are good, although the last couple of rolls have not gone in my favor, but I have lots of cards to discard if I do get a three or a four. So let's see how this goes. 
Okay, so it did put me into a crunch here. It wasn't a perfect roll. So I would have to disc uh, discard a couple cards, which I could do. This is always scary. It's, it's, it's like, it is very, very scary. So I convert one that would drop me into green. That's still good. So, I mean, discarding, I'll, what I probably would do is discard my other focus card, I think, for... Oh, it's so good, though. It bumps up my time so much. Do I want to keep... Okay, let me think about this. If I am currently sitting in the big top and I want to sprint back to the exit and then I want to walk back to him. Yeah, I don't need both walks. So I'm going to ditch one of the walks as a discard and maybe... Oh, I've got my short rest card too, though. i got to hold on to that in case things go sideways. So yeah, I'm going to go walk and focus, I think. Ugh, it hurts me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm going to discard these two cards in order to convert the three to a success. So essentially, we'll turn it around like this just to show it visually. And that is going to have me reduce the horror level, bring me back into the green, which is good. I do lose one time. It's going to drop that down like this. This card is now going to go in the discard. Okay, so with that resolved, now I'm into the three dice territory for what I'm hoping to accomplish in this turn. Next up, I'm gonna attempt to walk. That's right, I'm gonna do something really heroic, like walking. And we're gonna try to get closer to Geppetto here. So I got three dice going into this, which is why I boosted up with focus first, and so I can be rolling three dice for this. Hopefully that will help me out. I can convert from threes and fours, but I really love not to burn cards that way right now. Let's see how this goes. Oh my gosh, barely, barely made it. And it's funny, because the one success I have allows me to move one space, so I can move south, but I do lose a time dropping from five to four. And now I'm going to swing for the fences. Okay, we're going to do a weak attack. So we're rolling three dice. Here we go. We got three dice. I'm hoping for good things here. We just need to be successful. Um, I really hope that this works out for me. And again, timing on this uh, in terms of having the right... It says right here, you must have four or more health to attack with the strongman hammer. So as of right now, I have to have four or more health. So if I do land the one success, even though I lose a health, that happens after I've already included the strongman hammer as part of my attack. So, I mean, I might not be able to use it again going forward without healing up, but right now I've got the opportunity to make this work. So here we go. Three dice and let's see how it goes. Oh, barely, barely. Okay, so we got one. Thank goodness if that had a miss. Okay, so we are going to do four damage and are gonna be able to flip over the token to see whether we win the game. So coming over here, I'm gonna happily remove one heart. I'm gonna happily remove another heart and another. And we're gonna see how this goes with the final token. Here we go. Yup. That's it, he is done and actually dies from the weak attack. That worked out perfect. Now, there are tokens that have three hearts, two hearts, one heart. There's all kinds of tokens. I'll actually show you guys the other side of these tokens here. And I can tell you right now, they can come back to bite you big time. There are blanks in here, but just like any good horror movie, there's the opportunity for the killer to come back out of nowhere and throw a whole bunch of grief your way. So there's the opportunity for that to happen. Um, but in this case, my final girl, Asami, was able, with a weak attack, thanks to this strong man hammer which was a huge find very early on in the game when we found that in the deck after digging through we found the th I thought I was just going to be grabbing the throwing axe from uh, the location I searched in but instead ended up finding this extremely handy handy hammer that has done so much additional damage on top that it really helped but having to balance such a low health character at five where I think the character I used in my Kickstarter prototype play uh, years ago that one had six, I think, as the default health, so that would have helped a little bit. It always kept me worried that my health was not going to be at a spot where I'd be able to use this thing. And uh, you can discard it. Uh, of course, you're not allowed. It says right on the card, you cannot put this in your backpack because it's so bloody big. Um... But if you are under four health and you can't wield it and you don't want it to basically take up the two hand slots that you have when you carry it, you can just discard it and get rid of it and, and go searching for something better. But I just, as soon as I got that, or at least as soon as I saw it, I knew that that was kind of the weapon I wanted to wield to try to take Geppetto down and it ended up working out. 
Now I do want to talk about the instance, and believe me, this will happen while you're playing Final Girl, and it will shock you when it does. When you get something like this that says, oh, you're going to go ahead and give the killer some more health, how do you actually resolve that? Well, the black token that was here, so let's say hypothetically you only had these three hearts and the two hearts here. Let's say you flipped over the black token and it was the two hearts that you got. What you would do is you'd take this black token and put it to the side. You'd take a white token and place it on the bottom here, and then you would take one heart and place it here for a total of two. From there, you continue to try to hammer damage against the killer, and let's say hypothetically you hit it for one more damage, so there was only this white token at the bottom. Now, if you ever get all of the health markers off the board, and you're just left with either a white token at the end, or a black token at the end, in other words, the killer only has one health left, you have what's going on is called an adrenaline rush. So if either the final girl can even get this as well, because the final girl does have a token here and can come back even after being knocked down in the same way you just saw me bring back Geppetto as an example, um, if the final girl or the killer only has their final health token remaining, black or white, you can roll an additional one plus die for all your horror rolls, plus two dice if they're both down to only one health. This is indicated, of course, by the symbol right on the token. So you're probably wondering why was there a die and a plus one there? It's because of the adrenaline rush. So hopefully that helps you get an idea as to what would happen if the killer came back to life and if the killer was reduced down to just uh, one health remaining, the adrenaline rush that would then kick in. And of course, there's the opportunity for the final girl to lose a whole bunch of health to the point to where we'd flip over her token. And just for fun, we'll flip over ours to see if Geppetto had been able to do enough damage to Asami, what would have happened to her? She would have actually come back with one health. So even though I would have thought my game was over, I'd have just one more health, meaning this would just be removed and I just have a white token placed here and you could see if this was the kind of setup going on you'd have the plus two adrenaline rush going forward and that would get really crazy. And that, my friends, was Final Girl in a nutshell, and that concludes my playthrough. I really hope this helps you make an informed decision on the Kickstarter that's currently ongoing. I can tell you right now, on my plays against Geppetto off-camera prior to filming this play, and it ended up in a victory, which was really nice to see, the prior one I played just before I filmed, I literally got absolutely slaughtered. Geppetto was able to kill, along with the puppets, about 8-10 victims in the same time frame of a turn or in about a turn and a half or so it was absolute devastation the bloodlust went from a low value so high up so quickly that it ended up pushing to the point where and of course if your bloodlust goes to the very top and has to go any higher it starts looping up here and it states on this to discard a terror card which then starts pushing you towards the finale and the finale will have you flipping over a card here that is instantly going to change what's going on with the killer. And this is why trying to take out killers before finales trigger and more dark powers and more events and all that kind of stuff is really important because when you get up into this kind of situation, not only is this now impacting and changing what they're going to do, but you can see now it's also going to change up what the uh, puppets are going to do. They're now not just going to be moving around. They're going to be moving around and slashing things up while they do it. The killer is actually going to be hitting for multiple attacks. Like things just progress in such an aggressive way. So so in, my strategy going into this one was really to try and get all the victims away from the central area of the Carnival of Blood as best I could. And of course, that's not always going to work. You might try to do that and not be as successful as I was. I was very lucky in just how things panned out. Things change very quickly, and those terror cards can throw so many wrenches into what you think is a very smooth plan, but the game is absolutely awesome and feels extremely tense all the way through. So as you've heard in my top 20 videos, not only from the Rolling Solo community, but also my own personal list, I rank Final Girl extremely high up there for solo players. It is one of the better games out there, and I truly believe this is going to be a game that sticks around in your collection for a long time to come, especially because you can mix and match the killers with different locations. So you don't just have to go up against Geppetto at the Carnival of Blood every single time. Also remember, you have setup cards that are going to change 
change the original setup in terms of where the final girl starts, the victim starts, where Geppetto starts. All those things make the variability inside the game and the replayability just off the charts, especially because of that mixing and matching and the different setup cards. So you can't just go into every game with the exact same plan of action. That's going to wrap things up. As I mentioned just moments ago, thanks again for watching. And as always, keep on rolling solo.